Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good? Excellent, excellent. So today we're going to be telling you a story about uh, failed patches. The, the title of the talk is Bugs So Nice They Patched Them Twice. Right? And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at a set of case studies in Adobe products about how they go about fixing vulnerabilities and, and kind of something that we've discovered over the, our years of bug hunting and, and, and fixing vulnerabilities through the Zero Day Initiative program, um, how well they are actually fixing those bugs and if they're actually fixing them completely. And we're going to give you some, some stories there. We're going to look a little bit in uh, Adobe Reader's JavaScript APIs. We're going to look a little bit about uh, style form and XML transformations. Uh, we're going to look a little bit into indexing and fast searching inside of Adobe PDFs, and also how Adobe does file parsing and how well they do at fixing file parsing issues inside of uh, Adobe Reader. Let's see here. So first, I'll let uh, Abdul introduce himself. I'm going to present in English, which is easier for me. Okay, so uh, my name is... Uh, Abdelaiz Hariri. So I work from Canada, Montreal. Uh, I manage the analyst team inside the ZDI. So my team is responsible for, um, you know, root cause analysis of submissions that we get through the program, finding vulnerabilities, and, you know, reverse engineering various uh, products. Um, so I've been involved in the program since 2005, frequent submitter. And I've been involved in a lot of Adobe research. That's basically it. Yep. And so my name is Brian Gorns. I'm the director of vulnerability research inside of Trend Micro. And so my primary responsibility is um, the direction of the Zero Day Initiative program, ensuring that we are, are meeting the needs of the company and make sure that we are actually uh, working with the community, working with researchers within various regions to get the best vulnerabilities to come into the program. I'm also responsible for adjudicating and organizing the Pwn to Own Hacking Contest. How many have heard of Pwn to Own before? Pwn to Own, in the back, he definitely knows, yes. Um, so Pwn to Own is uh, one of the world's most prestigious hacking contests where we invite researchers from around the world to find zero-day vulnerabilities and write zero-day exploits against some of the hardest attack surfaces in the world. Right, so we're talking about Microsoft products, Google products, Apple products, um, IoT, SCADA, all of these different things coming into play with researchers bringing in research to to help the vendors fix and mitigate some of the zero-day vulnerabilities that exist in their products. And so that's kind of where we focus mostly on the offensive side, understanding how attacks work, how they manifest, and how we can protect against them. So just kind of to start off, we're going to kind of give an overview of, of what we're talking about, what we're seeing inside of the ZDI program, um, just to level set everybody in the room, and then we're going to go really deep and technical on various case studies in this product. So first, everybody used Adobe Reader before? PDF readers, yes, of course. It's the world's most popular PDF engine out there, right? And it's, it was actually released in uh, 1993. Um, and it's, it's got wide support, right? You can use it on Mac, you can use it on Windows, iOS, all over the place, which makes it a very interesting attack surface because one PDF can be actually used to target multiple, uh, you know, locations, uh, and it can also be used to, to, um, to, to hit many, many targets. It's kind of ubiquitous software, so it makes it very, very valuable. It makes the vulnerabilities and exploitation techniques very interesting for us to look at. And it's fully featured. There's a lot to look at, right? There's JavaScript. There, it parses tons and tons of file formats. Uh, it does all sorts of stuff, intercommunication, collaboration, you name it. They've baked it into the Adobe product. Now, if we look at the general architecture of Adobe Reader, there's really three things you need to know. There's the core, there's the plugins, and then there's back-end functionality. In the core, you have Acrobat DLL or AccuRead32 uh, DLL. Uh, it, it loads a set of plugins, and this is where all the interesting functionality comes into play. eScript for doing JavaScript, um, PDF, HT, HTML to PDF conversions, uh, annotations, forms, all of these different plugins that can get forced and loaded in to, Acro, uh, to Acrobat or AccuRead32. And these plugins can actually reach back-end DLLs, right? And this is where a lot of the functionality actually happens. And a lot of these back-end DLLs are also extremely old, 
right? And so what you want to do as an attacker is find a way to go from the core through the, back, uh, through the plugins into these backend DLLs that actually have the old functionality that contain a lot of zero-day vulnerabilities. And we're going to talk about that path here through our case studies. We had something. Yep. So I just want to add something. The, the plugins are, they have a specific file format. It's called .api, which is technically a DLL, but it has a, a little bit of a different structure. So the way it gets loaded inside Acrobat is a little bit different than a normal DLL. But basically, it is a DLL. So if you load it into IDA Pro, so basically, it's going to read it as a DLL. You guys can disassemble it and, and read assembly out of it. Um, the plugins are usually located inside a directory inside Acrobat called plugins. So if you go to the Acrobat directory or reader, and inside that, that uh, directory, there's a directory called plugins. And inside it, you can find all the APIs. Um, as for the DLLs, they're kind of scattered all over the place. So usually, you can find them in the root directory of Acrobat. Some of them are actually deep inside Acrobat. That's basically yep. it. So for us in ZDI, our journey really in, Acro in Acrobat and Reader kind of started in 2015, right? So prior to 2015, we didn't really receive a lot of vulnerabilities in PDF products. Right, it was kind of low. We were probably 10 to 20 vulnerabilities per year uh, coming in from the community in PDF products. And we wanted to change that. Uh, and so in 2015, we kicked off an internal research project where we would start to audit <coughs> Adobe Reader and Adobe Acrobat internally. And we, we, we kind of looked at all different types of bug types. We looked at the JavaScript APIs, and we found uh, memory corruption issues, use after freeze. We found uh, an interesting vulnerability class called JavaScript Restriction API Bypasses, which would actually allow you to elevate privileges inside of Adobe Reader. Um, and we also found a lot of file parsing issues. Right? So we started doing a lot of this internal research, and we started speaking about it on the conference scene, and that's where it really blossomed. Right? At that point in 2015, we got about 100 CVEs uh, or submissions into ZDI uh, in Adobe Reader. And you can see here in 2015, uh, 2018, you know, we're close to 250, right? And so one of the things that we can do in a bounty program is actually kind of lay the seeds of what people should look at. And as they look at our advisories and they look at the work that we've done and we've presented at conferences, they can take that and go try to find additional bugs uh, and a different, different uh, attack vectors. And they certainly have done that since we started doing this research. And now this is one of the most popular attack surfaces to look at, you know, like every Patch Tuesday, in, in when Adobe releases a, a PDF patch, there's usually anywhere from 70 to 150 CVEs being fixed at any given time. But what we noticed in this was these weren't always new bugs coming in, right? What we noticed is that a percentage of these bugs were actually researchers analyzing the patches, looking for where Adobe did not fully fix the bug. So they would actually find a bypass for the patch, modify the proof of concept, and resubmit the bug. Right? And so this is a, a trend that we started to notice in the industry is that a percentage of the bugs that we were getting in ZDI are actually nothing more than failed patches. Right? Um, and this was really fascinating to us. And so we started to do an analysis of what, uh, what that looked like and, and, and how well vendors were going about approaching the patching process. And in, 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 in ZDI, we, you know, we started to notice this, but we didn't really under, understand how much the community knew about this. Right? And so occasionally, you'll see chatter you know, on Twitter or in, in the underground about this. And so there are people that know that the vendors are not fully fixing the vulnerabilities that they are actually getting. And you can see this is a discussion uh, uh, back when the hacking team breach occurred uh, several years ago where hacking team was saying that you know, Adobe would, uh, would uh, you know, find, somebody would disclose them a bug, and they would look around and try to find, extrapolate, and look for different bugs in that similar area. Um, and of course, the researcher said, uh, Vlad, that the Adobe analysts are awful, and they're actually unable to extrapolate and look for other bugs. And you can see here that they actually point out in one of the ZDI advisories about a failed patch. Right? And so the exploit community is aware of this. 
It's not just the researchers, it's not just the vendors. And this kind of leaves consumers and, and users of that product in a, in a bad position because those patches aren't actually fully fixing the bugs, right? They're just point fixes that uh, can be easily bypassed. So usually, usually when, when a vendor like, gets or receives a vulnerability of, or finds something being exploited in the wild, they would actually go investigate it internally and start auditing that code base so there wouldn't actually be any variance. For example, Microsoft, um, there was a vulnerability at Microsoft, um, the RDP one. RDP, yeah. No, the SMB one from... Uh, Both. Well, from Shadow Brokers, the SMB one. So basically it was being exploited in the wild and Microsoft basically had like a, some kind of internal audit on the SMB code base and then basically they started finding more vulnerabilities. So that's how usually vendors do it but Adobe doesn't do it that way. So basically, they just try to patch the bug itself and just they ignore everything else just to get it done. All right. So we're going to go over these case studies. And first, we're going to look at the JavaScript APIs. And we're going to use a similar structure throughout every one of these case studies so you can kind of follow along. First, we're going to give an overview of what that attack surface looks like. Uh, we're going to talk about a vulnerability. And we'll provide you a proof of concept so you can trigger that bug. We'll look at how the vendor actually patched the vulnerability the first time and how they failed. Uh, and then we will talk about how it's bypassed and show you the second patch that actually fixes the bug completely. Right? So first, we're talking about JavaScript. This is every attacker's favorite tool. It's very, very useful for doing lots of different things. Um, but what's nice about the JavaScript APIs is it actually allows you to reach a majority of the back-end DLLs. And these are all, some of these are really, really old. Like, you can get to cool, you know, cool type font parsing, uh, uh, XSLTs, um, anything, JPEG parsing, Onyx. There's a bunch of different DLLs that you can actually reach through JavaScript, which makes it very, very powerful for us to use. So just a quick overview. Reader exposes a huge API in, the, in their own JavaScript. Right? Their forms, annotations, collaboration, all of this stuff is inside of, the, inside of the, uh, the API documents. And they're actually hundreds of, pages of hundreds of pages long. And we've actually read through a good chunk of them looking for bugs. Um, and that engine is actually based off of SpiderMonkey. Right? So there's an open source component to it. The um, JavaScript APIs, they can do all sorts of things. And the interesting thing is, is even though there's hundreds of pages of documentation for the JavaScript APIs, they're not actually fully documented. There's a lot of features in the JavaScript API that are undocumented. So you have to be able to go and like, actually reverse engineer and look at how the JavaScript works so that you can find all of the features, because there's a lot of bugs in the undocumented features themselves. And, and on, the, on the blogs that we've released on the Zero Day Initiative website, we've talked about how you can go find the undocumented APIs, what you can do, and how to audit those, those functionalities that aren't actually in the documentation. Actually, on the undocumented APIs um, topic, back in 2015, we found, I think in that collaboration module, we found a bunch of undocumented APIs. They didn't actually talk about them, about them in the documentation that allowed us to actually write files on disk, delete files on disk, like do any sorts of input-output. But these APIs were kind of privileged, and we used them later for um, code execution, but in a logic chain. So we didn't actually do any memory corruption. We just wrote a whole exploit using that undocumented the yeah. undocumented APIs. Yeah, it was quite slick. And speaking of privileged context, there's actually different ways of operating inside of the JavaScript APIs. There's two contexts that are available for you. There's the unprivileged or the non-privileged context and the privileged context. And that privileged context allows access to some, some of the security relevant APIs. And if you actually look at the documentation, Adobe will label the security relevant APIs in the documentation that you know that those have to be in a privileged context. Did you want to go over a privileged yeah. context? So if, if you're reading the JavaScript API, reference of Adobe. So every, every API has a bunch of flags. In the documentation, the PDF, I don't know if we have it here. I don't think so. No, I don't. So basically, if, if you have a certain API and it has an S, a red S next to it, it means it's privileged. So if it's privileged, then you need a higher context, basically a higher privilege to execute it. Usually when you open a PDF inside Reader, it's, it's being executed under the doc privileges, which, which allows you to do something really basic. Um, so if you want to execute certain APIs, which are a little bit more serious, then you have to execute them in a trusted or privileged context. 
And by trusted, it means it has to be in a trusted function. Basically, it has to be flagged as a trusted function and has to be wrapped between a begin priv and an end priv. And that's, that's the way you actually execute privileged APIs. And because of that, we found a bunch of, um, you know, logic vulnerabilities and basically we were able to escalate privileges. And because of that, we were able to execute the undocumented APIs. That said, we, ch we kind of chained like three or four bugs together and we were able to get code execution out of it. Pure logic, so it's it was 100% reliable. So it was no memory corruption, no memory, no heap spray, no shell code, nothing, which was kind of cool. I just want to add something else, that um, Adobe Reader has a sandbox. Acrobat back then didn't have a sandbox. So basically, it allowed us to write files on disk, do whatever we want. But in Reader, it was a little bit more involved, so we needed a sandbox escape for that. Yeah, so the first bug we're going to look at is in the annotations libraries. Um, and it allows for interactive forms and multimedia. Um, and, and what's nice about the annotations is they can actually be added and removed programmatically. And so you can see here there's an API called add a knot, um, and it, you can add a type of annotation to the PDF document. Um, and then you can actually get the annotations on with different APIs. And there's lots of different you know, annotation types that exist inside of uh, this library and, and these API calls. So this is actually a vulnerability that I discovered back in 2016, and I remember this uh, set of vulnerabilities really, really well because we, we, we found these when we were at a conference just like this one, and we were sitting in the back of the room auditing the code and reading all the JavaScript APIs, trying to find bugs. And, and the, the key thing we were trying to do is find ways of, of kind of deleting and removing the doc object. And we did this through app.doc.close doc equals true. And to trigger this bug, the way we did it is we actually had to create a proof of concept that would hold true to the APIs and force the doc removal. So in this case, we created an array and we defined a getter off of that array, and that event handler would actually close the doc object. And then we would add the annotation, and at a certain timeout, that would get triggered and force the doc object into a use after free condition. First of all, have you guys, do you guys understand what a use after free is? Use after free? All right, so C++, perfect. So let me explain something really quick. So in C++, you can allocate objects dynamically using malloc, right? And theoretically, once you allocate something using malloc, then you would have a reference to it, okay? Like a variable reference that, that holds that memory address. And let's say that reference is being held somewhere in memory. And then that object got freed, got deleted, okay? But you still have a reference to that freed object. So if someone calls a method out of that reference, then it's gonna cause a use after free because that object is deleted. So basically, it's gonna cause a crash. So what happened here in this case is basically you have an object and basically he forced that object to be freed using the closed doc. So basically he closed a document and it freed a bunch of objects, okay? And then he basically, when he calls the add annotation, it kind of deletes it and it actually reuses it again. So that's the crash that happens. Yep. So this is CVE 2016-0931, right? And we submitted this to Adobe and they fixed this bug. And we said, okay, well, hmm, is there any way that we can re-trigger that vulnerability using a different technique? And so we sat down and we started looking at how we go figure out how do we close the dock in a different way, and we came up with this proof of concept, which is almost line for line the same thing, except there's a different way of closing and forcing the dock object to be freed. And this way, we did it with app.exec menu item close, right? So, very simple, simple changes allowed us to re-trigger that bug and actually gave us another CVE in 2016, CVE 2016, 10, uh, 65. And so just looking at that, we were able to actually re-trigger a bunch of bugs. We found a bunch of vulnerabilities using this technique and then they were patched and then we re-triggered them all again with this technique and we were home free again, right? So nice use after freeze. And you can see it here, highlighted. So all, all they did was basically just scale or make sure that app doc, that close doc is not functioning anymore. So all, all Brian did was actually find another way to, to force the free, right? And that was through that API. Yep. 
All right, so we're going to dig deep into some really interesting memory corruption vulnerabilities, and, and you'll see there's always two CVEs when we talk about that, that's because, well, one was a failed patch and one was the one that actually fixed it. In this case, we're talking OCG, um, which is uh, optional content groups. So you can think of op as optional content group groups as layers in a document, right, that you can turn on and off to make them visible or not. Right? In this case, it's good for things like computer to, uh, uh, drafting um, or doing things like language conversions. Right? You can have a background and then have another layer in Arabic and one layer in English and turn them on and off based off of whatever the user setting is. So they're really you know, complex and, 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 and they provide a lot of functionality. So you can see here, this, is a, this for loop here allows you to get all the different methods off of a OCG object. Um, and you can see one of those is set intent. Right? And that set intent method actually takes, you can see down here at the bottom, an array as a parameter. And that's where we're going to start with OCG. Let me add something really yep. quick here. <clears throat> so in, uh, in Acrobat or Reader, if you, have, if you know there's an API and you don't know exactly what the parameters are, are for the API, so let's say there's an API, but you don't know what, what type of arguments it takes. So basically, all you can do is basically pass Acro help to it and it's going to dump exactly the, the type of arguments that it takes. So it, it kind of facilitates what type of arguments if you want to fuzz it or just test randomly. Pro tip right there, pro tip. That's worth the whole talk yeah. right there. <laughs> so this vulnerability is actually in uh, set intent method, right? So you know that you've got set intent off of an OCG object. You know that it's an array that's being passed in. And in the assembly, you can see that it actually is pulling the length property from the array. It's doing a little bit of math on it and enough math to force an integer overflow. So it actually wraps the integer and creates a smaller number than was originally intended. Uh, then it performs a malloc off of that and actually creates an heap object that is smaller than what the actual array value actually is. Then it goes into a copy loop and eventually performs an overflow when it's copying data into this smaller buffer. Right? So this vulnerability is it's a classic integer overflow. It's a heap overflow condition. I just want to add something. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you too much. That's fine. <laughs> so, so basically, it, it, if you pass a certain length to it, then it's going to do math on it. It's going to wrap. It's going to end up as a small length. But in the copy loop, it's going to use the original length, which is very huge. So basically, it's going to be copying data using a large size to a small buffer. So that, that's exactly what's happening. Here. So we've seen the set intent. We, this is what the code looks like. So you could actually find this vulnerability statically. You, know, you could just look at the code and see that it's possible. Um, so what does the proof of concept for this look like? Well, first, you need an array. So we define an array um, inside the getter. You can ignore this, this count stuff. That's not important. But you can see it's setting a length to a very large value. Uh, and then you're going to see us get an, a reference to OCG object. And then we're going to call set intent with that array. And when that array is accessed, it's going to go into this handler, redefine the length, and it's going to cause a integer overflow condition. But think, think of the define getter, this function, as kind of a callback function, right? So whenever this guy, whenever the first element of the array is being referenced, then this callback is going to be executed. And when this guy gets executed, then it's going to set the length of the array to 7FFFFF. Originally, the length is probably 10, right? But then it kind of sets the length to 7FFF. So basically, that's the whole bug. That's where the bug happens. So how would you expect to patch this? Right? First, you would say, OK, any value over a certain point uh, is going to be bad. Um, but that's not exactly how Adobe patched it. And if you can see, they just kind of basically took the proof of concept and plugged it into their code. And they looked exactly for that malicious value. Now, that's not the way they fixed the bug. Right? Um, quite, quite funny, quite interesting. Um, and so, of course, when, when this patch came out, you know, we have an active community of researchers who are looking at vulnerabilities. And one who guide, the guy who found this, obviously very interested in this patch. <clears throat> and so when this patch came out, uh, he looked at it <clears throat> and then quickly found out that it wasn't completely patched. 
uh, and he actually sent us a new proof of concept within an hour of the patch release. Right? And we always find that really funny when, uh, when a researcher submits bugs and then they immediately submit the patch bypass. Um, they're really paying attention to what's actually going on in the attack surface. They're really looking at what's being fixed uh, so that it makes it really, really interesting. So how do you bypass this patch? You simply change the length to a different value, re-trigger the heap overflow, uh, and quite enjoyable. So this is one of my favorite <laughs> favorite uh, failed patches in the history of failed patches, but uh, quite interesting on how, how the researcher went around fixing or bypassing that vulnerability. Of course, the actual patch, they actually do math and they actually verify the actual length is a, is a valid value, um, and they actually do math. You know, it's really hard uh, in computers to do math, and they actually make sure that the ra length doesn't wrap anymore. Um, so now we're going to look at uh, extensible style sheet languages, uh, trans transformations. And this is something that's used in XML uh, for transforming documents. <clears throat> now, in Acrobat, you can reach the actual underlying DLL, AXSLE, um, through JavaScript, but you can also reach it through Acroform, right? So there's different ways of triggering this code in the back with the actual vulnerability in it, which makes it a, an interesting attack surface to look at because we're in the defensive community in ZDI. What we need to do is understand how to trigger the bug that is back here in the back so that we can defend against the different variations of the, of the attack, uh, which makes it really, really fun uh, when you're looking at such a complex piece of software. Let's get back. Um, so eScript is responsible for JavaScript. Acroform is responsible for something called XFA. So basically, you have XML. Uh, you know, an XML elements and stuff like that inside the, the PDF, and all those XML, um, you know, elements and nodes are being parsed inside Acroform. So it, it's two different things, basically. Yep. So the XSLT parser, um, actually in the back end there, the AXSLE, uh, is actually based off of an open source project called Sablatron. Now, Sablatron, is, it, even though it is open source, Adobe took this code and integrated it into Adobe. And when you do that, you also inherit all of the security vulnerabilities and security weaknesses that exist in that open source code. Now, the problem with Sablatron is it's no longer maintained. Right? It's actually an abandoned project. So Adobe has to take on all of the security work that is involved in securing Sablatron now that it's been integrated into their product, um, which makes it challenging to say the least. Back in, uh, you can see here that because it's open source, people can actually use different techniques for fuzzing and they can and try to you know, instrument the underlying op, uh, open source code and send it to a fuzzer, maybe use different techniques to find bugs. And that's what happened back when in 2012 when Nicholas was actually trying to find uh, vulnerabilities in this product. Um, we got some of those bugs back in 2012. Uh, did we get those bugs or did somebody else get those bugs? I can't remember. But the um, people started looking at it again in 2016. A person out of, uh, out of Asia started doing fuzzing on this product, knew it was integrated in Adobe, and started to find a bunch of different bugs into the product and were submitting them into the program. And you can see they kind of died off here in 2018, but it's an interesting case study for kind of open source code being integrated into the product uh, and actually being used to find vulnerabilities in a closed source piece of software. I just want to add something as well that, um, so it's an open source project. Adobe just grabbed it the way it is, compiled it, and just put, put the whole project inside the, Adobe, uh, inside the reader and Acrobat. They didn't even do any auditing to it, nothing. So the bugs that were you know, introduced back in 2010, 2012, all the way up, they were in the code. They were actually exist in the same DLL. They didn't touch. They didn't audit anything inside the DLL. It's a gold mine. Got it. Put it there. It's a gold mine. So to reach that code, to reach that underlying XSLT engine, first you need an XML document. So you need to define an XML document. Then you need to define a style sheet that's going to use some of the XPath uh, and some of the style sheet languages. Uh, 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 keywords to actually trigger certain functionality. And then what's nice, because you can trigger it from JavaScript, all you have to do is call xmldata.parse. It will parse the XML data and then apply XSL. And then you're, then you're transferred into that underlying code so that you can actually start triggering some of the vulnerabilities that exist. So this is a nice trigger for you to use to start doing auditing in that area. You can see here, this is, this is just highlighting the different uh, XSL 
T code that's available, and you'll see how this kind of plays into the vulnerability here in a second. You want to cover these? Yeah. All right. So I'll talk about the first vulnerability, which was first found in 2012. And the reason why I'm going to talk about this one, because it was actually bypassed in 2017. So, so the bug was technically not properly patched for like five years. So basically it was, you know, released in public 2012 with a, with a public POC. And then it just stayed, someone kind of found a bypass uh, five years after. So it was uh, found by, I think, Nicolas Grégoire. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a yep. French researcher based in, from France. So first, the, the, the vulnerability is in the lang function inside um, XSLT. So basically, the lang function is being implemented inside the XFF lang switch case. And basically, inside that switch case, there's a call to a function called call func. So the way it actually works, basically, first, it just checks if the, the arguments passed to that lang function is just one argument. And then it checks the, the type of the argument, which is basically string check a string, just to check if, if the argument is string or not. After that, it basically goes through the nodes and starts iterating through them, checking the nodes. What happens is it basically calls to E over here, right? So this to E is quite interesting because it's actually a macro in C++. And the way it's defined is basically to E calls another macro called cast and basically tries to kind of change the type of a certain node. So cast is quite interesting. If you look at the bottom screenshot over here, so basically there's two types of that cast macro. The first one in debug mode, which basically calls dynamic cast in debug mode. And basically in production mode, or basically when you're not doing debug, it just does the classic casting. So basically what happens here is that you can do a type confusion because it's just doing you know, classic casting. So the POC was quite simple. Basically, you can just give it anything other than a string, and basically, it's going to cause a, a crash, right? So how did they actually patch it, which, which was quite interesting? So it seems like I went back and forth because I had to actually do like a bin diffing on all the previous functions, uh, previous versions of Reader. And um, just a side note that Adobe provides all the previous versions of Reader on, on an FTP server. So if you guys want to grab the old versions and do like bin diffing and stuff like that, you can do it easily. So what they did is basically they grabbed that POC and figured out, well, how are we going to patch this? Well, we just have to filter out those type of nodes that are being passed to the length function. So basically, they just make, made sure that the argument is not of a certain type because they thought that's exactly what's causing the crash. In fact, five years after, he figured out that the same researcher figured out that, well, that patch is not complete. So if you can pass other types of nodes to that function, then basically it's going to cause the same problem because they only filtered out one type, right? And remember when I mentioned the dynamic cast before? This one? So this is actually, this is actually the right way to do it and they only do, did it in debug mode. So basically, it was not activated. So the final patch was technically you have to point it at the thing. just to add a dynamic cast. So they actually had the patch in debug mode, but they didn't actually roll it in the production mode. And they actually didn't patch it well the first time and ended up figuring out, oh, well, we had to actually add dynamic cast in the first place. So that's how they did it. And that's, that's how the, you know, the, the whole thing was fixed. All right, so I'm going to talk another about another um, basically plugin. Actually, it's not a plugin; it's a it's a DLL. It's called Onyx32, but it can be reached from three modules: JavaScript, Catalog, and Search. So I'm going to give you a brief history about you know indexing Onyx and all that kind of stuff. So back in I think 2000 and probably in version six of Acrobat and Reader, pretty early. Um, so Adobe needed a solution to do like indexing for fast searching. So if you have like a big PDF and you want to do a searching, you need to do it fast, right? You, know, you want to do like fast searching in it. So they needed a solution that does indexing of this PDF. And they ended up buying a solution called um, Onyx, which was um, provided by a, a company called LexTech. So what's interesting about this library is that it's pretty old. 
And basically, what, 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 the way it does it, it creates index files, and these are binary file formats, and basically just tries to parse them from inside, um, you know, Onyx 32, which which is inside Acrobat. So if you disassemble the Onyx 32, you can find a bunch of exported functions, which is quite helpful. And basically, the first bug that I found was in 2018, and it was an untrusted pointer dereference. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this um, from another perspective. So I was actually preparing for Pwn2 on back in 2018, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually wanted to find a new attack surface in Acrobat. So I started looking at all the DLLs inside Acrobat so I can see which one was, you know, the oldest DLL. So I can start to audit that. So that's how I actually audit things. I go to the product, check the oldest DLL, start auditing that because they pro logically they haven't actually rolled a lot of uh, stuff in it. That DLL specifically, the last time it was actually touched was 2015. So basically, they didn't update that DLL since 2015, and I was actually auditing that in 2018. The only thing that I actually needed to understand is how to touch that DLL, or how to actually trigger code or parsing inside that DLL from JavaScript or from any other attack surface that I can control as an attacker, right? Um, so I figured out that I started playing with something called the catalog, and the catalog allows you to grab a bunch of PDFs and create an index files for a bunch of the, uh, PDFs. So what happens is when you, when, you, when you basically create a catalog, it creates a PDX file and creates a directory. Inside it, there's two index files. It's a master index file and a slave index file. And in order for you to actually start parsing those index files, you have to pass the path. This is all JavaScript, by the way. And then call build. And once you do that, you can start actually parsing. It's going to parse the index files. So if you want to fuzz that, you technically just have to start modifying the index files and call build, right? And then you have, you have a nice attack surface over there, untouched. No one audited that before. So it was, it was gold. So what happened is, basically, we send those. Uh, I, find, I found like four bugs. I sent them to uh, Adobe. They patched them. And the way they patch the bugs, because Onyx is not actually maintained inside Adobe, so they had to send the bugs to the company that owned Onyx, right? Which is a third party company. And they had to wait for that company to actually roll the patches, which took a lot of time because the other company are not really, you know, they're not, they don't have the experience in patching bugs, security issues, and stuff like that. So what they did, Onyx did patch some of the bugs, but Adobe, kind of killed that API. So basically, I couldn't actually trigger the parsing anymore. And they, they got back to us. They were like, listen, please don't send us those bugs anymore because there's no attack surface for, this, for those type, type of bugs. Funny, at the same time, one of my friends who's a researcher called Sebastian Appelt basically reached out to me. He was like, well, I, I saw that you're actually working on this attack surface, and I'm working on the same attack surface, but from a different perspective. So I worked on it from the catalog um, API, and apparently he was actually working on it from the search API, which was way different. So the nice thing about this API is that Adobe didn't actually figure out one thing. So for Adobe, there was no attack surface for it, because for them, all the search, all the search APIs were basically privileged. So if you want to execute or trigger that parsing, then you have to bypass privileges, right? Or just escalate privileges inside JavaScript. The only thing that they missed is that Sebastian found out that if you actually pass the active doc um, argument to the query API, then you can actually trigger the parsing again from non-privileged context. So basically, he bypassed everything, and he was able to trigger all the parsing again through JavaScript, which was quite fascina fascinating. And because of that, he started sending more bugs, you know, and they had to actually fix them this time because they couldn't actually patch it, right? All right, so I'm going to talk about the first bug that I actually found in the indexing, which was quite interesting, at least for me. So as I mentioned before, all the vulnerabilities inside the indexing are basically found inside onyx32.dll, which is the, the Lex stack one. Um, so this one is particularly interesting because you can overflow an internal object and then overwrite a specific pointer. But the value that you overwrite with that pointer was basically a counter. 
And in order to influence or increase that counter, you have to replicate a certain object. So once you replicate that, the counter is going to be incremented, right? Um, so I personally found it through my fuzzing framework. Um, Sebastian actually found it as well. It's, it was a duplicate, so he sent it to us and we had to reject it because it was a duplicate of my vulnerability. But he found it through an AFL. Have you guys heard of AFL before? AFL, the fuzzer? AFL? Okay. So basically, WinAFL is a spin of AFL, but it's uh, the Windows version of it. So actually, once you replicate the objects, so imagine you're actually incrementing the counter. So in order to get to that controlled number, I had to replicate that object like thousands of times. So my index, my index file was like 10 MB or something, which was huge. Theoretically, it's possible, but I provided control to it. So once we sent that bug to uh, Adobe, in turn, what they did is basically they sent it to LexTech, and basically LexTech, the, the third-party company, they had to try to patch it. When they released the, the advisory or the patch, Sebastian sent me an email, and he goes like, well, I can actually trigger that bug again. And I did, like, I, I was like, what's happening there? So I, I ran another fuzz, uh, fuzzing session, and I was actually able to trigger the bug again. So what they did is basically they added a magic value. If, and they didn't actually patch the bug. So if, there's a small compare. If you bypass that compare, if you have a magic value inside the index file, then basically you can bypass it, satisfy that condition, and basically trigger the bug again. So it was an easy bypass. So how do you guys think they actually patched it? The real patch. So they went a little bit further than that. They killed the whole thing. They moved the library. From the whole thing. <laughs> so there is no indexing anymore. Because the, the problem that they had is basically Onyx was not the, the third party company. They were relying on the third party company to do the patches. And, and that, the third party company, they actually didn't have a headcount to do that, <laughs> which was quite, quite sad. So in the end, Adobe decided to stop that indexing, they actually disabled it. So if you want to enable indexing, you have to enable a registry key inside the registry. So by default, it's disabled because it's super buggy. So that's, uh, that's what they did, basically. You're right, though. You can, they have to do that, but you know, that's the easy way. They easy took the way. easy route. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you want to go over that? It's fine. Go the ahead. first slide. Go ahead. You want me to do it? Yeah. All right, so, um, so this is specific for Acrobat. So once, if you have an image and you give it to Acrobat, then you can actually convert it to a PDF, right? If you have a JPG, any file format, like any image file format, you can convert it to a PDF in Acrobat. And the plugin that's responsible for doing that is, is image conversion. So image conversion, that API, technically supports multiple file formats. And the nice thing about that plugin is basically it leverages multiple open source projects. So let's say it uses libpng, libtiff, libjpg, openjpeg2000 to do the image parsing and then conversion to PDF. So theoretically, if, if you guys fuzz or find vulnerabilities in those open source projects, then it's highly likely that you're going to have a vulnerability inside Acrobat. All right? That's, it's a given. So. And that's, a lot, that's how a lot of researchers do it. They basically go fuzz the open source projects because it's fast, it's easy, you can do it on Linux, right? And you can, you can kind of enable ASAN and, and all those you know, tools. And once you have a vulnerability in those open source, then you're good to go. So um, notably, a lot of the vulnerabilities that we got were in different file formats, JPEG 2000, EMF, but I'm gonna specifically talk about um, EMF in this case because we got a lot of vulnerabilities in EMF. EMF is a pretty old file format from, the from 1993, which was um, you know, created by Microsoft. Initially, it was WMF, then it kind of evolved. And 
basically the way it works is that EMF contains something called records. So it has records inside from as part of the file format. Each record contains a type, a size, and a bitmap record buffer. And each record, each buffer contains a parameter and a padding. So each record is basically, you know, it has a unique hex value to it. The bugs that I'm going to be talking about basically affect the alpha blend um, type, or basically record. So the way it works that when, when you have a record, an alpha blend record, basically it specifies a block transfer of pixels uh, from a source bitmap, bitmap to a destination rectangle. So basically it does like a, some kind of copying from one buffer to another, in a nutshell. And I'm going to get to that later. And I just highlighted here the hex value of it inside the AMF file, so you, can, you guys can see it. Just want to add something here. Mm -hmm. Good. So how does it actually work? So initially you have the EMF parsing. Basically it parses the record and then it allocates a buffer. Once it allocates a buffer, it chooses the compression, right? And after the compression, it starts parsing the bitmap data. So parsing the bitmap data goes, that's, that's a separate function. It goes through a switch case. It checks, it checks the bit count. Based on that, it goes allocate, it allocates a temporary buffer. Once it allocates a temporary buffer, it copies the data from the temporary buffer to the actual buffer that allocated in the first place. So this is, this is how the functionality works. So let's, let's get into the bugs now, which is the fun part. So CVE 2018-48886, which is a heap buffer overflow. So first, let's, talk, like, let's break it down by each stage. So basically, it starts parsing the EMF record data, specifically the COI source, bit count, width, height, and X source. And all these are basically found inside the EMF file that you guys have, right? So you guys can control those values from inside the file. Once it parses those, um, you know, those fields, basically then it goes and allocates a buffer. So the buffer allocation first checks the height, checks the width. If the conditions are satisfied, then basically it goes and allocates a buffer, right? The buffer is allocated by this formula, which is technically multiplying the source by three if bit count is 18, or by four if it's not 18, right? So can you guys see the bug here? Yeah, what I'm talking here. You can, can you see the bug over here in this line specifically? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Hadi. So let, let's put it this way. So this is, this is a, there's an integer overflow over here, yeah. okay? So basically if you have, since we control the source and we kind of control the bit, right? The bit count. So let's say you have bit count three in this case, all right? And then you control the CX source. So if you actually give it five, 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 six, and then multiply it by three, it's actually going to wrap. And it's basically going to end up as two. Right? And that's going to allocate a small buffer, right? And that's the issue here. It's basically an integer overflow, right? So let's continue. Basically, this is, this is the allocation here. And this is the initial bug. This is what's happening in here. Next, it goes to the, to the bit BI compression. Basically, it supports three types of compressions. In this case, we're going to go with RGB, right? Which is OK in this case. Finally, we're going to go to the actual parsing. Remember this, this guy? It's the small buffer that we allocated here, all right? From, but from the parsing, you, you, if, if we specify 18, then it goes and allocates a temporary buffer. The temporary buffer is big enough, right? Once that copies the data, and basically it's going to overflow the smaller buffer that we actually, right? So that's exactly the bug here. And, and this assembly is just going to show you that it's being copied 
to a small buffer. So how do they actually patch it? For them, what they thought, because remember that initially it goes and allocates the buffer base on B width and B height, right? Because they went, if you go back a little bit, sorry, I'm going back and forth, over here. So basically if the B height and B width are satisfied, the conditions are satisfied, then it's gonna go ahead and allocate this buffer. So what they did, they thought, oh well, let's go back and check B height and B width, right? And that's what they actually did in this case. They had a specific formula over here. In this case, it wasn't satisfied because the whole assumption was wrong. So if B height is equal to one, this guy is equal to one, then basically it doesn't actually hold anymore. So technically, if you can provide, um, if you can provide the same thing, basically you just, the only thing that you have to do is basically provide B height as one, and then you can, can actually trigger the bug again. So basically this was the, the, the bypass of the whole thing. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about how they actually really patched it. We're gonna get to that later because there's another bug that I'm gonna talk about in the same component. So I, I, I spoke about that function that basically triggers a heap overflow, right? It does the same thing, allocate a buffer, and then choose compression, and then does the bitmap. In this case, if, <coughs> let's say we chose a count of 20, right? and basically it allocates a temporary buffer. The temporary buffer in this case has this formula. Can you guys see the, the bug here? Yes, no? So it's basically the same thing. Basically we have bit count 20, hex 20, and we control the width, right? So if we give a big width, shifted by three, then basically it's gonna overflow, and we're gonna end up with a buffer size of four. So basically it's gonna wrap. And what happens here is basically you allocate a small buffer, and then it actually tries to copy using the big size. So what happens is it triggers an out-of-bound write. So basically because you have a small buffer and you're trying to read way beyond that, so it's an out-of-bound read, right? So this is, this is the, the second bug. So how did they actually patch this one, or try to patch it? So they went, if you check the call stack from when the crash happens, check all the functions that got called before. So they actually went really back. So instead of patching, usually you would see a patch from here, but they actually went all the way back, which is kind of cool, because they, they tried to patch it from the root cause, from you know the source of it. But what did they actually do? Again, they checked for seven F, 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 F. So they gave it a static value and they were like, if it's bigger than seven F, 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 then no, we don't need to actually parse it, right? If it's smaller, then fine. Well, I, actually, it, it, they, in, instead of giving it a range, basically just specify a specific, specific value. And this is how it looks like in assembly. Basically, you have a compare. So. Let's go back to the initial line. This is, this is after the patch. Consider this, if you have a bit count four and you have this value, which is less than seven F, 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 F. So basically it's gonna trigger the bug again, which is sad, right? And then you can trigger the bug again. So I, I spoke about BI RGB as a compression, but the funny part is this, the, the other compression, which is the bit fields, it's basically a copy paste of that function. So what they did, they basically copied the code of the RGB compression, and they used the same code as in, in, the, in the bit fields compression. So, what, so Adobe basically patched two bugs inside this function, but because it's Adobe, they didn't actually you know, run a full audit. So technically, the both bugs were actually applicable here as well. So once they patched this guy, the, the guys actually triggered the, bug, the same bugs in the other function because they're technically a copy paste, basically, a, a code reuse, which is sad. So how did they patch both bugs? It's integer overflow, come on guys, math. 
well, that's, that's the right way to do it. Basically check, uh, apply some math and just make sure it doesn't overflow and stuff like that. But it's Adobe, man. So basically just killed the whole thing. Just <laughs> <laughs> they just killed it. So basically they removed the whole functionality again so you cannot parse EMF anymore. So it's the easy way around it. Yeah, we're systematically removing features from Adobe Reader yeah. over the years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll give it to Brian so he can uh, conclude. Excellent. All right, so in, in conclusion, in, our, in, in, in Adobe, there's, there's a huge attack surface, right? And we just covered, you know, four or five bugs, but there's a significant amount of bugs across this product that have the same sort of failed patch storyline. And we actually did an analysis, and we looked at the architecture of Adobe and said, okay, well, where have we seen failed patches in the past, right? And, uh, of course, it took a lot of time because we have a lot of bugs uh, to analyze, and when we actually went through it, all of these components in red are components that have had failed patches in them, right? So the one thing that researchers can do, especially if they're starting to come up in the industry and they want to learn about how, uh, you know, products are fixed or how to trigger vulnerabilities is to start, look, start looking at the patches that are coming out. Abdul mentioned earlier in the presentation that all versions of Adobe are available out there for you to look at. And every Patch Tuesday, there's another set, or not, well, every couple months on Patch Tuesday, a new set of bugs are fixed and a new set of places to go look for an audit, right? And then that's what we want to encourage people to do. We want to encourage people to actually go and look at these pieces of software, look for the failed patches, and submit them to, to Adobe or submit them to us as part of our bug bounty program to get them fixed, right? Because the more work that we do in this space, the harder it is to actually exploit the vulnerabilities in question. If you look at it from a defensive perspective, patching is very challenging. Now, checking for 7FFFFF is not the most you know, thorough patch, but as an end user of the product, you're having to deploy those patches in your in customers' networks over and over and over again for the same bug all the time, and that makes it very, very challenging for you to defend against, but also to, uh, to make sure that you're securing your, your customer's ecosystem. Um, it's, Adobe's not the, we, we sit here today and we kind of make fun of Adobe for the failed patches that have happened in Adobe Reader, but they're not the only one that have this problem, right? We've seen failed patches in Microsoft multiple times this year, failed patches in Microsoft, failed patches from Apple, failed patches from Oracle. All of the big vendors have this problem. And it's not just the big vendors, it's also verticals, the ICS world, the in, industrial control world, riddled with failed patches. So it actually takes time to actually eliminate all of these bugs. From an offensive perspective, from a researcher perspective, patch diffing is a very effective way of going and finding bugs, especially in some of these you know, products that are riddled with failed patches. Um, it's simple and inexpensive to go take a proof of concept that somebody publishes and tweak it and see how the, ch the, the code flow changes to see if you can reach different parts of the code base to trigger vulnerabilities that exist. You saw just in the EMF example, there's, like f there's probably six to eight bugs just in tweaking bits in the field to get the code to go down different paths to actually trigger the same vulnerabilities that have been just copy pasted from one place to another. So it's important to go look at that and always check for, you know, comparisons against 7FFFFF because yeah, that's the master of all evil. Yeah, if, you see, if you see that in the code, then there's a bug. There's a bug in there somewhere. So, um, so quite fun. Um, and with that, we open the floor to questions. Thanks for having us out here. We appreciate all the time. Any questions? <coughs> Questions? In Arabic or in English? Uh, thank you guys for the excellent presentation. It's, uh, it's very interesting as usual. So I'd like to ask if you see um, embed PostScript as a attack surface for Adobe. I know Microsoft killed that uh, attack surface, but we still see it as an active in other word processors such as Hangul and the Korean market and uh, used by different attack vectors. And uh, still, this is one of the file formats used in Adobe Illustrator. So have you seen a lot of submission coming from this? Postscript? Yes. Yes. So uh, I, will, I will tell you this. So we got probably in the past couple of months, probably in, in six months, in the span of six months uh, from one researcher, probably 50 Postscript bugs in, in Acrobat. Uh, so what they ended up doing is basically they ended up mitigating that by having a pop-up that says, you are parsing a dangerous file format. So you want to continue or not? 
Come That's on. exactly what they did. And uh, he's the same researcher that gave the blue hat talk in, uh, in, in some country about PostScript engines, basically. Well, they consider it as one of the dangerous attack surface. It's the, no way they will remove this component. Definitely. From. definitely. Yeah. It's, it's very old and it's, it's, uh, it's very rich, per se, right? It's like JavaScript. So um, they're, they're, we were quite shocked with the type of vulnerabilities that, we, that, that, we, that were found there. Like it can be as simple as untrusted pointer references, basically. That type of bu bug. So, thank you. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? No time. Okay. Okay. So you can find us around if you guys want. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>